looking at the guidelines on oral treatment of type 2 diabetes, you can find that uh, uh, guidelines judged to be of higher quality contain more recommendation consistent with evidence-based conclusion. The quality of guidelines development processes vary substantially, suggesting that the guidelines need to be evaluated seriously and applied to your population. Very often these guidelines do not consider the population where that guideline should be applied. And this is diabetes. Uh, considering that diabetes diagnosed in China is the same as di diabetes diagnosed in the UK, and definitely is not. And you cannot apply sicca simpliciter the same guidelines. Now, and there of course the question is, do we need algorithms and guidelines or doctors? Now, doctors tend to reject the vision of standardization as it ruthlessly undercuts the view that physicians are particularly wise, special, insightful, and worthy of autonomy, and instead seems to assert that medicine should be run like an assembly line with limited opportunity for personalization. Complex problems like diabetes need smart solutions. What is, uh, uh, how can we define a smart solution? Is a set of, that was the definition I found it and translated on an Italian dictionary. Cytopsychic is a mental faculties which allow men to think, understand, or explain facts or action, and also enable to adapt himself to new situations and to modify the same situation when this shows barriers to adaptations. So this is our smart approach to diabetes. This we published this recently with one of my co-workers, Ernesto Maddaloni. Safety, smart state for safety, multifactorial approach, risk therapy. This acronym say safety first, primum non nocere. The challenge for the diabetologist is to choose the best safe approach, in particular with potential adverse effect and benefit of intensive glucose control. Remember that intensive glucose control leads to hypoglycemia. And if you suffer from hypoglycemia, and you are an elderly person living alone at home, that's a very serious problem. So you have to balance the hypo hyper and hypoglycemia based on that particular patient. Multifactorial. In diabetes, we have to consider a multifactorial approach because there are relevant cardiovascular risk factors other than hyperglycemia that coexist, mainly cardiovascular disease and uh, uh, kidney failure. The risk reduction. In particular, in the young people, we have to have an approach that considers the risk reduction crucial because risk reduction in a subject of 40 years that is a risk of cardiovascular disease means that we need to be very tough in controlling the disease compared to an elderly patient where we should not be too tough because of hypoglycemia. I'll show you this in, a, in an algorithm that we prepare, personalized algorithm. Therapy, therapy is becoming, uh, for the T, increasingly complex due to the complexity of pathophysiology and therefore this concept of the smart approach should be the key to turn a therapeutic complexity from a problem into an opportunity. So smart, smart diabetologists, this is what I teach to my friends, fellow. So you should be a smart diabetologist, because not simply a diabetologist. And remember this uh, multifactorial risk reduction therapy. So safety, kidney failure. We know that diabetes is the major cause of uh, kidney failure in the Western world. And patients that are in, uh, uh, um, in, in hospital because of, uh, of dialysis, most of these patients suffer from diabetes. And of course, these patients need to be treated with insulin, patients that tend to have hypoglycemia often, so it's a very serious concern. So safety, kidney failure is one of the most important aspects to take into consideration, and the problem of glycemic target is one that we discuss a lot in our congresses, because the, uh, the problem of hypoglycemia is related to the intention of the, of the diabetologist or even the GP to obtain excellent metabolic control. The patient said, oh, well, less than seven. Fine, I must be 6.5. 6.5, six. Wow, fantastic, six, you are nearly normal. But then hypo. Hypo at home or in condition of driving the car could be very dangerous. We have no data. Now let's try to look at data of potential accident in cars because of hypoglycemia. There are no data because it's very difficult to measure blood glucose soon after a car accident. And, and of course, there is the adrenergic response. So uh, uh, we may envisage that uh, uh, the, the catecholamine response could increase immediately with blood glucose, and therefore you cannot really detect 
an hypoglycemia. But there are now studies that try to investigate how hypoglycemia could affect driving. That is the algorithm that uh, we prepared with uh, other leaders in the field, with David Leslie in London, Juliana Chan in China, Raf De Fronzo in uh, um, US, Louis Monnier in uh, uh, um, France, Itamar Raz in Israel. Just to give you the idea that we came from all over the different places to try to have a physician personalized approach to diabetes. It's a very simple concept, A, B, C, D, E. E, it is the new one that I briefly uh, tell you what is the E stands for. Um, the A is the age, the B is the body weight, the C is the presence of complication, and D is the duration of diabetes. Now, very simple. If a doctor remember A, B, C, D, the age doesn't cost, you just ask. B, body weight, doesn't cost. Complication, it may cost something, but you know what complications are uh, present in that patient, and the duration of disease Maybe for type 2 diabetes is not so easy because the patient may have been diabetic for longer and been diagnosed after a few years of hyperglycemia. So these four criteria should drive the way how we treat our patients. Because the younger is the age, the lower should be the target, glycated hemoglobin. Faster we should reach the target and the time frame should be short, three, six months. Older the patient, safer the target, slower the rapidity, and the time frame could be even longer. So that is an example of how the age could affect uh, our approach to treatment. Hypoglycemia awareness tends to decline with time because a patient that is young can feel hypoglycemia. A patient that is not so young because of diabetic neuropathy may not feel hypoglycemia. And therefore, hypoglycemia can be a serious hazard. Complications tend to increase with time. And of course, that we have to keep in mind when we decide what type of drug we give and the response to treatment that usually is very good to start with, but this response to tend to decline and most patients end up with dealing with insulin. And the HbA1c should be very tough and low in the younger patient, can be higher in the HbA1 uh, in older patients. The same for body weight. Body weight, just to give you an example here, response to therapy with thiazolidions and the GLP-1 analogs that are now very fashionable, new drugs in treatment of diabetes. And uh, uh, the insulin sensitivity tend to decline. The comorbidities and macrovascular diseases tend to increase with time. So all these four therapy, all these four letters, and the B, the body weight, should be calculated before we decide what therapy to do. Complication as well. Life expectancy. We cannot deny the life expectancy in a, in a young patient with diabetes is a very important criteria to keep in mind before we offer a therapy to control diabetes. But if you are 80, 75, 80, it has been shown in a very nice uh, evidence-based long-term study called ACCORD and also confirmed in another trial called ADOPT that if you actually try to control diabetes too tight with glycated hemoglobin at 6.2, you increase mortality. So you cannot really keep the same patients 6.2 or 8 without considering the age. The age becomes the key criteria to decide what is your target. The duration of disease, of course, is linked to the age and then the duration of the disease. And this is the, uh, uh, for those of you interested, the HbA1c and ABCDE uh, of glycemia management in type 2 diabetes, a physician personalized approach. Uh, where you can decide what to do based to the patient risk of weight gain, hypoglycemia, and cardiorenal complications. So that's quite easy to uh, apply. Considering the 15 to 40, you may find strange to have 15 years for patients with type 2 diabetes, but now remember that now type 2 diabetes in the young equal type 1 diabetes in the young. In terms of prevalence, the prevalence of type 1 diabetes, the insulin type 1 autoimmune diabetes is 10% of all cases of diabetes, 10%. The type 2 in the young is 10% as well. So that's terrible. We have a lot of obese children, a lot of obese adolescents, and that's why type 2 diabetes increases. So thank you. The type 2 diabetes increases in children. So um, the point is that uh, patients and doctor approach, I show you here how we can consider the personal approach to type 2 diabetes. If you do not communicate, that was a very nice editorial in The Lancet a couple of years ago. If you do not communicate with your patient clearly and do not treat your patient in a dignified manner, you are not providing even the bare minimum of health care. Our conversation with patients are a critical part 
of patient care. So what about diabetes affecting personal life in children? Just give you an example. School. Children do not receive intensive diabetes treatment in school. Sometimes teachers are even not aware because the mother don't want to tell that the child is diabetic. Treatment performed away from classroom where it's given can impact on class attendance. Family. Family must change various aspects of their lifestyle to fulfill the demands of treatment. Quality of life becomes seriously affected, uh, in particular in the first few years. Personality. Teenagers perceive diabetes having negative impact on their lives and feel depressed. Depression and discomfort. Diabetes control. Managing your blood glucose four times a day or even five times a day to adjust your insulin injection. Still, we give insulin subcutaneously, although there are the pumps available, but still 80% of patients with type 1 diabetes receive insulin injection. Four insulin injections a day. And so you can imagine how that affects. And regarding adults, uh, diabetes is a life-changing diagnosis. Daily life, dietary changes, modifying food choices, that can affect family meal times, the disability, amputation, sexual life, erectile dysfunction, dysfunction is in one in two patients with type 2 diabetes. And I'm going then to the, um, the E that I mentioned before, and I have to show you these slides, I, I conclude in one minute. Okay. The term empowerment from the web empower is to define the, uh, to permit to give power or authority. This is where the IDF, the International Diabetes Federation, have put its finger to say empowerment is the way how we should involve our patient in, in uh, treatment. And uh, that is the uh, ABCD with the addition of the empowerment. And the patient perspective, normal glycemia, easy to use, safe and tolerable, immediate benefit, inexpensive. And the physician perspective, the durability, easy to prescribe, reduce complications and long-term benefit to preserve beta cell. So this is the balance where we have to consider our therapy for for patients with type 2 diabetes. Thank you very much indeed. I'll even try to contribute more and compensate uh, these four minutes uh, with the 15 minutes presentation. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm, I'm very keen on, on time management. Now, after this comprehensive presentation by uh, Professor Pozzilli, uh, it is very difficult to uh, enter another completely different field of medicine and talk about uh, the issues of person-centeredness in that field, uh, which are in, in many ways uh, tautologic, because mental health is presupposed to be person-centered. And uh, uh, it is very challenging uh, to enter into such many details as the previous speaker when speaking about uh, psychiatry and uh, uh, clinical psychology. So what I'm going to do is to rather introduce you to what has led to estrangement from person-centeredness in mental health care over the past 40 or 50 years. Before that, uh, let me to just say that psychiatry as a discipline exists since 1808. So, in terms of history of science, this is one of the youngest medical disciplines and has nothing to do with the ordinary medicine as conceived uh, in uh, internal diseases, surgery and so forth that has been practiced for centuries within a disciplinary framework. Therefore, we should keep in mind that uh, we, we have a kind of proto-science in a sensu lato. This is not uh, the kind of science which the rest of medicine is, like endocrinology or cardiology. My wife is a cardiologist, so I'm tempted to speak much about uh, the uh, uh, estrangement in, in person-centered terms uh, with cardiological uh, uh, practice patients. Uh, but those disciplinary matrices that regular science belongs to are not applicable to psychiatry, which is still a proto-science, so my focus will be not how to reintroduce person-centeredness that has been lost, 
but to speak to you about the epistemological foundations which led to a crisis in psychiatry and clinical psychology as the disciplines constituting mental health care and which prerequisite the uh, estrangement for, from the person. Those are six concerns of methodological origin and one of psychological, in my perspective and in this framework of analysis. The first one is the so-called explanatory gap. This is a well-known term for those of you who have philosophical background or education. For those who haven't, let me to just say a few words. The explanatory gap has been defined centuries ago as incommensurability between natural <coughs> sciences and humanities. And initially it was the psychophysical problem of the so-called mind-brain debate. This was the overt expression of the explanatory gap. And a multitude of solutions of the mind-brain problem have been applied throughout uh, the centuries from antiquity to Renaissance when the first discoveries in anatomy and physiology of brain have contributed to revision of the classical dogma uh, which actually consisted the mind-brain debate, so-called monism and so-called psychophysical dualism. The advances of neuroscience in, in 19th century led to a modern interpretation of the psychophysical debate, which is called Windelband's dichotomy, defined by the sociologist uh, Windelband, who was neo-Kantian thinker. And in Windelband's dichotomy, you have nomothetic sciences, which are explanatory, and neuroscience belongs to them. This is the one which is supposed to be a counterpart of psychiatric explanations in terms of pathophysiology. And the others are the ideographic sciences, which are presupposed to deliver humanistic, person-centered perspective, the narrative, the patient, and its values. Those two, from the perspective of Wendelband and the Neo-Kantian school, are incommensurable. And they are incommensurable indeed. Because uh, the narrative is very difficult to translate into physical terms or the terms of neurobiology. So, in 20th century, two polarities of the psychophysical problem have been identified. One was eliminative materialism and the other was modern dualism, respectively adopted by biological psychiatry and the psychotherapeutic trends uh, which came originally from clinical psychology but were adopted by psychiatry later. Eliminative physicalism postulates that eventually neurobiological knowledge combined with uh, cybernetic modeling or computational modeling will lead to explanations which are ultimate and do not need any mental terms to be understood. I know this sounds kind of abstract, so let me give you an example. In the late 80s, mirror neurons were discovered to be related to empathy. If Churchlands, this is a family, uh, which has uh, uh, developed the theory of eliminative materialism, if church lands are correct in their postulation, then over the next 100 years, we shouldn't speak about empathy at all. We should speak about the activation of our mirror neuron system. This is complete terminological shift and complete uh, elimination of the values and humanities knowledge by uh, biomedicine as accompanied with computational sciences. This is the view has been adopted 
by biological neuropsychiatry. And modern dualism postulates that these two, the narrative and the nomothetic part of psychiatric knowledge, the understanding and the explanation, are completely different, though might be considered uh, as two separate parts of the formulation of patient case in the so-called uh, biopsychosocial model by Angel. That explanatory gap still exists. And still, you cannot find professional approach to synergistically add the two perspectives towards one patient. The second concern is the overestimation of mechanistic biological explanatory models, which began with the dopamine hypothesis in schizophrenia as an exemplar. Most of the biological neuropsychiatry currently is driven from similar receptor disease models. They are slightly more sophisticated at this point. My, my colleague Ken Schaffner, that I have uh, a few uh, joint papers with, and uh, Ken Candler uh, have uh, published uh, uh, recently an excellent critique against the dopamine hypothesis as a prototype for most explanations in psychiatry. No matter how many receptors you add to a pathogenetic constellation, and uh, in schizophrenia, there have been added serotonin receptors, glycine receptors, and so forth and so forth. You remain mechanistic and oversimplistic in the way you approach disease. What is highly problematic, however, is not just the oversimplification, but the fact that any of those explanatory models eventually does not work when compared to psychotherapy or to placebo-controlled groups in evidential trials. The third concern, which estranges psychiatry from uh, the person-centered perspective, is the high level of paradigmatic controversy, or inter-paradigmatic controversy, which eventually led to what Paul Feyerabend used to coin as epistemic anarchy. All the status of science where anything goes. You may have one patient with panic disorder treated with any of those three approaches, psychoanalytic uh, psycho approach, behaviorist approach, and humanistic approach, and none of them is compatible to the other. You cannot follow up on that patient who has been treated with any of these approaches. And an attempt to combine them might not be harmful, but is completely untransportable into the professional narrative of any professional who may succeed you in the therapeutic process. What I have highlighted on this slide is the confusion which is added into this paradigmatic anarchy. And this confusion concerns the humanistic theory which has been established by Maslow in the late 50s. Uh, which, uh, and Carl, uh, Carl Rogers, and which is the basis of the so-called person-centered psychotherapy. At present, there is a, a terminological and epistemological confusion between what person-centered should mean on a conceptual level and what person-centered or humanistic therapy means in psychotherapy, where it means actually values-based assessment. No, not in full Fordian terms, in more general terms, it is a therapy focused on values and preferences of the patient. The fourth concern, which is entailed from the previous, is misuse of therapeutic methods, not to say abuse. And these are psychosurgery in the 50s. You may be aware of the misuse of psychosurgery after Agash Munich, which was actually awarded with Nobel Prize. The misuse of conventional neuroleptics in the 60s, which has 
awful, terrible side effects and adverse events related to the treatment with that group of drugs. Uh, the electroconvulsive therapy, this is what ECT stands for, and the psychoanalytic therapy, which is added here not because it is biological, but because it can be harmful as well. You cannot imagine, those of you who do not practice psychoanalytic psychotherapy and not interested in its critique, uh, which began with uh, the, the uh, seminal work of Adolf Grünbaum from the University of Pittsburgh, but psychoanalytic psychotherapy is responsible for about 30% of suicidal attempts within the therapeutic process of personal therapy. So imagine that you go to therapy just to be persuaded that you are such a mediocre uh, living creature which is not worth living, actually. <laughs> so you solve your problems tragically. Your fifth concern uh, is uh, actually uh, and, and the most important that I'm uh, very uh, keen on uh, and uh, we're currently... Uh, publishing in Oxford University Press a book on this issue uh, is the validity of psychiatric taxonomy. And uh, here are listed some of the traditional and some of the alternative models of psychiatric uh, uh, classifications. The categorical model which uh, uh, has been governing the 20th century psychiatry has been adopted from medicine. As you know, categorical models entail strict boundaries between the different nosological units. Dimensional model was adopted in the 80s and 90s and partly in DSM-5 from psychology, which is highly dimensional scientific enterprise. And alternative approaches which have been highlighted over the past decade a prototype cluster and person-centered diagnosis, which are high umbrella diagnostic systems. This is to say that categorical and dimensional models do embrace classifications which consist of about from 10 to 100 taxons. Initially those were 300 taxons. And uh, those alternative uh, models, they conceive no more than 10, actually. Uh, broader diagnostic units. Well, this is the model of translational validity which has been introduced in cooperation with uh, Professor Borgwart and Professor Stiglitz from the University of Basel and is currently being tested experimentally. Uh, I'm running out of time so I'll skip this. These are the conceptual issues about psychiatric uh, practice and theory. And there is another psychological issue which is entailed from my first presentation this is burnout in mental health care which is prominent when compared to other uh, other disciplines uh, in medicine comparable only with palliative care and general practice the the most outstanding issues which lead to burnout in mental health care are problematic effectiveness and outcomes in psychiatry the financial restrictions which are global uh, mobbing and bullying and workplace and depersonalization, dehumanization as outcome. One potential way out of this crisis has been proposed by the person on this picture, which may be familiar to some of the attending uh, colleagues in the audience. This is Kenneth Fulford, who is the proponent of the values based practice as an intermediate or integrative approach between the biological uh, neuropsychiatry and uh, humanistic neuropsychiatry, uh, humanistic psychiatry and psychotherapeutic practices. To move forward, we need to establish a values-based practice along with the evidence-based practice in psychiatry. What I try to highlight in this presentation is that due to a number of epistemological issues, we still have no evidential basis for psychiatry. We still have no evidence-informed psychiatry. And therefore, we are still far away from rehumanizing and personalizing the psychiatric and psychotherapeutic practice. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody in Madrid. It is really an honour to be able to give this presentation to such an esteemed audience. A very big thank you to Professor Andrew Miles for asking me to do this. And I have another thank here. My friend and colleague, Peter Harton, from the School of Nursing and Midwifery at James Cook University, who is sitting guarding the door at this moment so people don't walk in on this recording, has been an enormous help in helping me get this recording going. So we'll, we'll push on with the presentation itself. Child and family-centred care. Well, family-centred care needs a definition. And for our purposes here, family-centred care is this, a way of caring for children and their families within health services, which ensures that care is planned around the whole family, not just the individual child or person, and in which all the family members are recognised as care recipients. That's better, I can see the screen now. In other words, when a child comes into a health service for care, you can't plan care just around that individual child. You have to plan care around the family, and the family is the unit of care. Now, where did this come from? Family-centred care as a model of care has evolved over many years. As we know, the first children's hospital started in the early 1800s, with the first one opening in St Petersburg in 1802. This is the Hospital for Sick Children in London, with doc started by Dr Charles West in the, in the 1850s. And uh, children's hospitals were designed to look after children, but of course, as with all hospitals in those days, things had to be done correctly. Rules were paramount, and this picture here is a, a children's ward in a Children's Hospital in Australia. Pete, can we start this again? Hmm. <laughs> because if you turning that screen around then and waffling like an idiot. Um, yeah, and the screen turning around I think will be better for you. Yeah. Yeah, all, all we need to do is just go back to the top. Okay. And so I just say to the people, we start again? <laughs> yeah, well they may, not catch, they may not catch it because once they hear the first one they might skip ahead, but we can. We can tell them afterwards. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, begin recording again. Good afternoon to all our friends and colleagues in Madrid. I am really sorry I cannot be there with you to present this paper. It's a great honour to be part of this new association and a, a very big thanks to Professor Andrew Miles for setting it up and for inviting me to be the Family Centre Care representative. I have another thanks to give. It's to my friend and colleague Peter Harton from the School of Nursing and Midwifery here at James Cook University, who's actually sitting here guarding the door so that people don't walk in on this recording. Peter's been terrific helping me set up the technology around this. So child and family-centred care, a time to question. Yes, I think it is definitely time we question this. What is family-centred care? We have a definition, a way of caring for children and their families within health services, which ensures the care is planned around the whole family, not just the individual child or person, and in which all the family members are recognised as care recipients. In other words, when a child comes into a health service for care, we can't plan care just around that individual child. The whole family is involved, and so the family must be the unit of care. Family-centred care hasn't always been around, of course. It's evolved over time. And as most of us know, the first children's hospitals in the world emerged in the early 1800s, with the first one opening in St Petersburg in 1802. This is a picture of the Hospital for Sick Children at Great Ormond Street in London, opened by Dr Charles West. Hospitals in those days weren't meant to be places that were specifically wonderful for children. They were there for, to make the children better and all the rules had to be obeyed. And this is a ward in a children's hospital in Brisbane in the 1930s. And you'll see the really important things about this are that the wheels are all turned around the right way. The nurses are standing with their hands behind the back, their backs, and there are some toys for the children to play with, but it's very neat and tidy. They were the important factors. We did terrible things to children. There's a cage over a cot to keep a child in. And hospitals weren't designed 
for children, with children in mind. Everything was adult size. And of course, cross-infection was always a big consideration. People were terrified of the, the children's diseases that, and the infections that could be brought in to hospitals and given to children. And so around all this came parents, and parents were not allowed to stay with their children in hospital, as is common these days. It was genuinely believed that when a child was admitted to hospital and the parent left, the child became very upset. Therefore, that the nurses and doctors of the time rationalised that because the child was so upset when the parent left, it was better to exclude parents completely. And this is back in the days when children would be in hospital for umbilical hernia repair for eight days, and if they had something like tuberculosis or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, they could be in hospital for up to three years. And in that time, many of them never saw the parents. The parents weren't allowed in. It was genuinely believed that this was best for the children. And so children in hospital looked like this. They were usually, it was a miserable experience. Then in, some people started to question this. Renee Spitz, a, an American psychologist, coined the term hospitalism for children who had been so hospitalised that they could not relate to anyone or anything outside the hospital. They were totally institutionalised. Sir James Spence, in the 1920s at the Hospital for Sick Children in Newcastle upon Tyne in England, started admitting breastfeeding mothers with their babies. He published this in journals like The Lancet and got himself into terrible trouble because the medical establishment believed he was doing the wrong thing. But these two men were the real pioneers and revolutionaries. John Bowlby, the eminent child psychiatrist who showed that children who were separated from their mothers at an early stage were in grave risk of going on to becoming, uh, having psychopathology at later, uh, later ages. He was the theorist. Uh, James Robertson took his work. James was a social worker from Scotland who took Bowlby's work, did his own research around it, and went around the world showing that children who were separated from their parents at an early age because of hospital admission were disadvantaged and went on to have other illnesses in time. Robertson and his wife Joyce were missionaries. They travelled the world with this message and people started to catch on. Very importantly, in 1959, the British government published this report, The Welfare of Children in Hospital. It was a committee set up to look at children's hospitals, chaired by Sir Harry Platt, who was the president chairperson of the Royal College of Surgeons at the time, and it has become known as the Platt Report. There were 55 recommendations in the Platt Report, but the most important ones were that children be admitted to hospital with their parents, that parents have accommodation provided for them, and that play and school facilities were provided for the children while they were hospitalised. It took many years for the Platt Report to, to gain ground, but many uh, lobby groups, parents groups, grew up around the world. And these days we have these organisations still exist to put the message out there that children needed their parents when they were in hospital. Models of care with these principles started to grow up. Care by parent developed in the USA in the 1960s where purpose-built built facilities had accommodation for parents and other family members and the idea was that the family would actually move into the hospital unit and carry on normal life while the child was being hospitalised. Of course very expensive to set up because you actually needed purpose built facilities. And Casey developed partnership in care in the UK in 1988 where parents were recognised as being in a partnership with the health professionals giving the care. And then this thing we call family-centred care developed. Around about the 1970s, we start seeing it coming through in the literature. And now, of course, family-centred care as a model of care is ubiquitous in health services across the world. I've not been to a hospital 
anywhere in the world to their children's ward that doesn't have either a formal written policy of family centred care or at least an informal policy where people say, oh yes, of course we practice family centred care. Now what is the family centred care model? The important thing is the family remains at the centre of the child's life. It's structural and environmental, so you need parents' accommodation, bathrooms, kitchens, meals, laundry, parking, etc. Importantly, you need parents to be present and welcome to be present during interventions that are happening to the child, for example, uh, intravenous insertion or um, uh, lumbar puncture, whatever. The important thing to remember, though, with family centred care is not that parents have to be present. They can be present, they can encourage and support to be present for these things if they want. But of course, some parents may be too scared, they may not be able to. It's important to note, to realise that with family centred care, we mustn't force the parents to be, we must support them in their choice to be there or not. There are many cultural factors around family centred care, and of course, that means that in many countries, Family centred care might mean different things to different people. We need to educate staff about family centred care within the family centred care model, and of course, we need to educate the family as well. One of the keystones for family centred care is effective communication between parents, children, and the hospital staff giving the care. And often it's the breakdown of communication that causes the problems that I'll be telling you about in a minute. There's got to be support for parents and siblings and members of extended family. So if family centre care is really working, we welcome the, the siblings, the grandparents, anyone else who is considered part of that family. And a family centred care model to work well needs involvement of cons consumer groups such as the Association for the Wellbeing of Children in Hospital or Action for Sick Children in the UK. Organisations like that need to be involved to ensure that the consumer voice is heard, the parent-child voice is heard. But what family-centred care is not, and this is where we start to get into problematic areas, parents do not have to give basic care. Family-centred care starts to break down because people think that it means that the parents must change the nappy, feed the baby, bath the baby, give the child their meals, sometimes take observations, all of these things. That is not family centred care. If the parents want to do those things and they want to be part of that, that's well and good and we support them. But if they don't, we mustn't force them or consider them bad parents if they choose not to be involved. Family centred care does not mean that the parents are part of the nursing workforce for that ward, and it happens. It's not just being present for single interventions, for example, venipuncture or anaesthesia induction. Of course it's good when those things happen and the parents are, are encouraged to be involved, but it doesn't mean that the parents have to be there and it doesn't mean that just because a child allows, uh, uh, sorry, a hospital allows parents to stay with the child during anaesthetic induction, for example, while the rest of the hospital doesn't practice all the tenets of family centred care, that doesn't mean that that hospital has a policy of family centred care. There should not be an expectation that parents stay, and there should not be an expectation that parents will want to be present. All parents are different. Some parents will want to be there, some parents won't. They are not bad parents if they decide they do not want to be part of these things. And parents are not there to meet the needs of health professionals. The health professionals are there to meet the needs of the children and the parents during this traumatic time of a hospital admission. It's not the other way around. Now we, we get into murky waters sometimes with all of this because one of the important things we have to think about, especially in this day and age when society has rapidly changed, we have to think about what is a family. For the purposes of family centred care, what is a family? My definition is that it is whatever that family declares itself to be. So if a family comes in and they've got 101 Dalmatians, then we as health professionals caring for a sick child have to accept that that's the family and the care is to be planned around that whole family. And of course, what is a parent? These days things have changed. 
We now have same-sex parenting. We have transgender people who are parents. We have adoptive parents. In Australia, our Aboriginal families often have more than one parent for each child, more than two parents for each child. And Aboriginal families like to, likely to have many parents for the one child within that cultural group. So we have to be very aware of what a parent is. We have to accept, again, accept their definition of who the parents are. Only by doing this can we begin to make family-centred care work effectively. Now that brings us to the idea of is family-centred care the best model? We hear a lot about it. We see it in all these hospital documents and all these policies. I'm thinking that it has come to be just what Alice in Wonderland saw in Through the Looking Glass. She said, when I use, or Humpty Dumpty said, sorry, when I use word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And I think that's where we're up to with family-centred care. Everybody uses the term, nobody's really sure what it is. And that's because we've never been able to really test it properly. I know this because I've done a Cochrane review of family centred care, I've even done the update. And when we did the original one in 2007, we found no solid evidence that we could include to tell us whether family centred care worked or not. When we did the update in 2011, only one study could be included from around the world. In other words, we have no real evidence as to whether family centred care is effective or not. We don't know if this thing works or if it makes a difference. We do know, though, that there is a lot of really good qualitative research coming out describing concerns with this model we call family centred care. I have a Joanna Briggs Institute review of qualitative studies about to be published on this. And the consistent themes that come up in the qualitative research is that Staff are judgmental towards parents. And, um, this is all staff, nurses, doctors, allied health. Parents are being punished if staff consider that they're not good parents. Staff acting as gatekeepers to the children. They won't let staff acting to stop parents coming in if they think uh, they're not good parents. Parents having to use strategies to have their needs met instead of the health staff being aware of the needs of parents at this traumatic time. Parents are having to manipulate their system and their communication to have their needs met. Managers using parents to replace staff. The nurse manager comes down from the adult section of the hospital and says, oh, you have all these parents in the ward. I'm going to take one of your staff members to staff intensive care tonight because we're short up there. They do not understand that Family-centred care requires more staff because you're dealing with several people as a unit of care, not just one individual patient. And interestingly, it's coming through that parents are becoming resentful at being made to do what they see as nurses' work. They are asked to do the basic care with the child, and some parents are saying, why am I being asked to do that? Surely that's the job of the nurses. So it's interesting that it has come almost full circle from the times before the Platt Report. I think family-centred care as we know it results from communication breakdown. My own work has shown that often hospital staff don't understand the needs of parents when their children are in hospital. Uh, Gudrun Christiansdott here from Iceland, and Inge Hulstrom and I from Sweden uh, have done some work on this, Janine Young from here in Australia. And we found that parents need to be able to trust the health staff. They need to be trusted by the health staff. They need effective communication. And all these things were more important than having their physical needs met. When we asked staff what we thought what they thought parents' needs were. They were more likely than parents to think that the parents needed help to have their needs met. Now that means uh, they, the, parent, the staff are over, overly paternalistic. They don't understand that parents are more independent 
than staff think they are. And so there's this breakdown of communication around what parents think they need and what staff think they need. Of course, we have these parents from help. There is no getting away from the fact that some parents are incredibly difficult to deal with. And of course, as well as that, we also do have parents who, are, who abuse their children, children under child protection orders, and that's what they're admitted to hospital for. So it's often, um, a rosy picture is often painted of parents but we must remember that every so often we, have, we do have very difficult parents and parents who may not be the best for their children. In these cases, family-centred care becomes even more important if we think it works because this is where we really need to support the whole family, not just the individual child. Now, I've explained that uh, family-centred care is ubiquitous, it's held up as the ideal model. We don't know if it works or not, but we do know there's problems with it, and we know that staff, our health professionals do not always recognise the needs of parents when their children are hospitalised. I think at the core of some of this is a project that I'm doing at the moment around concepts of who owns the child in hospital, and I'll just ask you to watch this space and look for the publications when they start to come out. We haven't finished that project yet. But I think if we have parents who have a, are sitting with the child in hospital and the nurses and doctors come in and say, oh, he's my patient today, or uh, I'm looking after him, he's my patient for this shift, I think that we can see a tension build up between parents and staff as to who really is the important one at the core of caring for this child. And I think the communication there, that's a tension that can compromise good communication. So what can we do? Family-centred care remains the ideal. Philip Derbyshire in the early 1990s said that family-centred care was a wonderful ideal but very difficult to implement effectively. Of course, the family remains the centre of a child's life. Common sense tells us that when a child is in hospital, they need their parents. And interestingly, some work coming out by Mohammed al Motlek from Jordan is now commenting on the fact that in some countries, family-centred care is a luxury, not a necessity. I will add another point in here. We often hear people from developed, rich countries say, oh, those developing countries, they've got it right. The parents are always there. Family of care works magnificently in develop, developing countries because the parents are always there. My experience, and I have quite a deal of experience in developing countries, the reason the parents are there is because the health system is so poor, it cannot afford to employ enough nurses. So the parents must stay with the child to give nursing care. Now, according to my definition, that is not family centered care because there is no choice. Parents have to stay because otherwise the child would get no, uh, no care at all. But Mohammed makes a very good point that in some countries, family-centred care is a luxury. Family-centred care, as I have described it, is a luxury, not a necessity. And we do know that probably family-centred care is not working. Is there an alternative? What we've seen with family centred care, I think, is that it has become such a sacred cow that people say, oh, yes, of course we practice it. Yes, it's wonderful. Yes, it's amazing. We must do it. Of course we do it. And there's many, many policy documents and a lot of money put in by health services around the world writing these policy documents about this thing we call family centred care. But I would certainly argue it has become a sacred cow and it's really time to start thinking about what we're doing with it. Should we be looking for an alternative? Of course, when any child comes into hospital, there's several things we must do. Of course, we must retain parents or family members as the core of the child's mission. We must negotiate with them to see what level of involvement is best for them. They don't have to stay. The, the, 
mother might bring the child into hospital and the nurses will say, are you going to stay with little, a little Billy or Mary? And mum will say, well, I've got twins at home with the chicken pox and my husband's off work and I can't stay. So the nurses in that case must gear their care around supporting the child whose mother cannot stay. She's not a bad mother because she can't stay. So we must negotiate to work out what level of care is best for the child and the parents at the time. We have to educate all health professionals about how best to do this. All disciplines of health professionals need this education. And of course we need to educate the children and parents and families about how to navigate the health system, why family centred care is important, how to communicate with them, how to have their needs met. And we have to provide the family with as much support as possible so that the child is supported. So these things are all given. These are what we need. But there is something emerging that is an alternative. Now, this isn't my work. I've not been able to come up with an alternative. But Bernie Carter, Professor Bernie Carter from the University of Central Lancashire in England and Karen Ford from Sydney in Australia have come up with an alternative. And they're calling it child-centred care. Their book has just been published and there'll be a reference list with this, with this presentation and it will be in that. It's a really worthwhile book. They've defined it as child-centred care means that children and their interests need to be at the centre of our thinking and our practice. Of course, Bernie is talking about health professionals when a child's admitted to hospital. So children are at the core of the, of the practice. With family-centred care, it's the family that's at the core of the practice. So a slightly different emphasis. And the child-centred care model, as Bernie has described it, centres around the idea that children are active agents in their own health care. Of course, that is slightly different to family-centred care because with the family-centred care, while we can pay attention to the fact that children are their own agents, we usually rely on the parents and the family members. So this is a, a difference. These days there is an increasing recognition across the world about children's right to participate in their care. In a child-centred care model, we look at the child in family versus under the family-centred care, they talk about and family, so the child and family. The child is a key and active member of the partnership in child-centred care. Part of the model they describe is recognising that children's views may not match their parents' views. However, child-centred care still recognises the centrality of parents for the well-being of their children. Bernie and Karen give these uh, factors that must be included in the child-centred care model. Number one is to consider the whole child, not simply the illness or condition. Treat children as children and young people as young people, not, not as many adults or not as something that uh, has to be communicated with in ways that um, are not child friendly. Be concerned with the overall experience of the child and family. Treat children, young people and parents as partners in care. Integrate and coordinate services around the child's and family's particular needs. Graduate the children smoothly into adult services at the right time. And this is particularly important for children with chronic long-term conditions. Work in partnership with children, young people and parents to plan and shape services and to develop the workforce. Now many of these things are part of family-centred care, but the the shift in emphasis here for child-centred care is that we regard the child as the agent around whom care should be planned as the core with the family as active participants, but the child as the main agent. Research has started now by Bernie and Karen into developing this model. 
They are excellent qualitative researchers. It's going to be just as hard to examine child-centered care with quantitative research as it has been to examine family-centered care. But this is a model that we, we, sh we should watch and see how it develops. It's going to be really good if they can get some really good evidence out about this because we've not really been very able to generate a lot of evidence about family-centered care. So to conclude this presentation, and again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do it, I'd just like to pass the message on that family-centered care is a wonderful ideal. We don't know if it works or not because we have no evidence. It, is, it, it could work very well. It may not work very well, we just don't know. We do know that there are grave concerns with the way it's implemented around the world. And this new model of child-centered care is possibly an alternative, and it needs as much testing as family-centered care does. But ultimately, for all of this, the main thing is to ensure that the child and family have as tra trauma-free experience as possible when they come into healthcare. So thank you very much, and I wish you all the best with the rest of the conference. Well, while he's doing that, can I just say it was very nice to be invited, except I have to confess I rather invited myself because I got one of these circular emails, which was my first acquaintance with this society and its conference, and I saw what it was about, and it was about being person-centered in healthcare, which is splendid, and, and I just completed an evaluation of something called personalization, which is the same thing, actually, um, for adults with profound learning difficulties. So I thought, I wonder whether that would be of interest to the conference, and as it, as it is, it was, and I'm very pleased to be here. Now, I'm going to be describing um, an evaluation of a program which was provided, providing person-centered support for adults with learning difficulties, some with profound learning difficulties. So we're talking about a very different kind of person, a person who may not have language, a person who may present themselves quite often in a very unattractive way. They may be violent, they may be self-harming, they may be harming those who are trying to support them. So we really are talking about a very different group of people in one sense, although absolutely still people. So one of the things I hoped I might do today was just maybe to think, to help the people here to think about what they might provide through their health care for this particular group in the population and what some of the issues might be. So that's, I suppose, my most straightforward objective. Um, the second is there may be things to learn from the way this support has been organized around people's aspirations and needs, which has something to teach all of us in other forms of healthcare. And the last thing, and I'd link this with the Australian presentation, I will be saying a little bit about the virtues of program evaluation. That is, the slogan of the company which I head up is, you innovate, we evaluate. So if you're going to do something new, you're going to innovate, it's great at the end of it to say, yeah, it was fabulous, we enjoyed it, but having objective external evaluation can be an essential element in making sure that what you've done is actually publicized and developed elsewhere. Okay. So the participants in what I'll be describing, and I've put the most important ones at the top, 70 adults with learning difficulties. Now, we're talking here about learning difficulties of such severity that the local authority has a statutory responsibility to provide some form of support from them. And that form of support used to be predominantly institutionalized, and there are all sorts of horror stories about what institutionalized support for learning disability was. Many people with learning disability were kept sedated so they didn't cause any trouble, or they were physically restrained, and there were all sorts of records uh, of abusive treatment, sometimes intentionally abusive, sometimes abusive just through disrespect and contempt. Now, what I've been privileged to be associated with 
is a shift from that kind of care to a much more personalized care where people with learning difficulties of this kind are living in their own flats or living in houses and living something that is much closer to a normal and good life. Now that's been a dramatic shift and it's been very exciting to be involved in charting that. Now this particular support has been provided by um, a charity called Choice Support. So they are the providers of this specialised support. And we've got two colleagues who I'll introduce in a minute from Choice Support here, so they can tell you even more about it than I can. Uh, their work was commissioned by the London Borough of Southwark. So they were the commissioners of personalised support. And then my unit comes in at the end, the parasite, if you like. The Social and Health Evaluation Unit was responsible for evaluating whether this personalised support actually did what it said it was going to do. Now, the relationships between these different participants are all interesting, of course, but the most interesting one is what choice support actually provided for these individuals. The relationship between the commissioners and the providers is fascinating, of course, for students of social policy, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. And then the relationship between evaluation, I will be saying a bit about that, because quite apart from it being business for me, uh, I do believe very profoundly that external evaluation in some form is an invaluable part of any new process and innovation. So, uh, I've realised now that I'm a follower of, I uh, maybe got the name wrong, Tandelbaum, who we learnt earlier today, fuses together the nomothetic and the ideographic. You're all looking blank. You weren't listening, were you? This, this, <laughs> this was earlier on. Now, I'm going to try and fuse together the nomothetic and the ideographic by um, leafing in some uh, case studies of some of the actual uh, people in Southwark. And the first one is Cathy. Now, Cathy is smiling there and looking very charming. But I have to say that initially, Cathy, although, of course, like all human beings, she had a like of attributes was generally very less than charming. She was clearly an unhappy person. She was a person who would actually attack, physically attack, many of her carers. So she didn't have any of the immediate appeal which the idealized patient might have, who's going to be grateful. Far from it. She was very antagonistic and violent and leading really a very restricted and unhappy life. Now, as a consequence of this personalization program, uh, Kathy was one of the first peaceful people in Southwark uh, to have one of these things called an Individualized Service Fund, an ISF. Now, this is one of the things I'll be describing as a characteristic of the program. And you have to understand that the financing of support used to be via a block grant, per capita, but a block grant. And the assumption in that block grant though, was there would be similar treatment for each individual. Now, a big shift was to move to this thing called an individualized service fund, which was a sum of money actually set aside on the basis of an analysis of needs of an individual. Now, Cathy was the first person in Southwark to have one of these ISFs. And her ISF was meant to cover the cost of 14 hours support a day. So that's quite a lot. That's actually employing a support worker for 14 hours a day. She couldn't share the sleep-in staff. I'll be talking about them later. That's the people who provide some measure of uh, night support because her needs were too complex and, frankly, her behavior was too challenging to herself and to others. She used to live in a registered care home. She doesn't like women to the extent that she would become aggressive by any w to any woman, carer, or supporter who was involved. Now, given the uh, gender profile of support staff, that poses a major problem before you go any further. Um, she would be really aggressive towards them. Uh, to give an example, um, Julie, who I'll introduce in a minute, was telling me that one of her first meetings with Cathy was that Cathy actually jumped on her, grabbed her by the shoulders, pushed her down to the floor, and sat on her. So, patient centered with that, eh? Uh, <laughs> since having her ISF, Kathy has moved to her own supported living flat, 
with a garden and she is now presenting no challenges to her supporters at all. She will tolerate the occasional need for new staff and will accept being supported by women. Now, this is quite a transform transformation for a person with the kind of learning disabilities and the kind of behavioral profile she had before. Uh, Kathy's manager, as a result of staff development training, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, um, began to appreciate that one of Kathy's problems was she didn't know what was going to happen next. And the fact that she didn't have the kind of notion of the future and what was going to happen was a constant frustration to her. And a lot of her violent behavior was her actually trying to come to terms with the unpredictability of our life. Well, we all find that difficult, don't we? But we like to think we've got some sort of notion of what lays ahead of us. You know? She didn't. So one of the things the support staff did was to try and help Kathy to sequence things and understand the sequence. So the member support staff would use a visual planner with pictures so that Kathy knew exactly what to expect every day. So Kathy is one of the success stories and I shall be talking a little bit more about the intervening variable, if you like, the personalized program which led to that success. Now, the 70 adults, let's uh, get on to the nomothetic rather than mediographic. Um, these are 70 adults we're talking about. Choice support actually provides support for nearly 200 uh, people with learning disabilities, but these were 70 who were receiving the uh, you know, maximum levels of support. 26 of the adults have no speech whatsoever. Now, what a challenge that is for personalized health care, isn't it? Where one thing we rely upon is speaking. The doctor speaking to the patient, the patient articulating their needs, perhaps in a pleasant way, perhaps in an unpleasant way, but they can articulate them. 26 of these service users don't speak at all. 22 of them have little speech, and 22 have very limited speech, but they are able to answer questions, but not to the extent that you could uh, go and say, would you like to fill in this survey to tell us whether you like what's going on? Yeah. So we are talking about people with profound learning difficulties. The way they live now, I'm glad to say, is supported accommodation in houses, usually with three or four people with learning disabilities and support staff living in the same house. And the house is as close to normal as it can be made. Now that is an incredible transformation from institutionalized care. They also are supported in activities in the community. They're not just supposed to stay in the house, but a lot of the support is to help them to get out and do various things, which I'll be able to tell you about. Now a little bit about Choice Support, this splendid organization that actually provides this support. Um, they are a leading social care charity that supports people with learning disabilities people with mental health needs, people with physical disabilities, and homeless people. But we're concentrating today on the support they provide for learning disability. And this is a good moment for me to introduce my colleagues who will put me right. Uh, first of all is uh, Stephen Rose, who is the Chief Executive of Choice Support. And then next to him is Julie Carson, who's one of the area managers and actually a person who was providing support for some of, these, some of these people. So I hope they'll put me right. And if people have questions, they'll give much better informed answers. Now, what about this business of person-centered? Now, after the profound linguistic and philosophical analyses we've been hearing, uh, I feel almost ashamed of these humble comments, but I've, I've said a rose by another name because what I'm describing is described in social services language as personalization. Lovely kind of Teutonic word, isn't it? Personalization. It actually started in computing um, when uh, computing firms said that they could personalize a computer to suit the individual. That's where the word came from. But it's been adopted widely in social services. And that's, I suppose, something for you to know, that when you talk about person-centered in medicine, your colleagues in social services may well be talking about personalization. And what are the important notions of it? Well, the individual is at the center. One of these platitudes, but a very important one. And the test of any social service or support is they have to explain what that means to them. It's not enough just to subscribe to a bit of rhetoric. They actually have to say what things they are doing 
and what impact this is having on the service users under the banner of personalization. It's individual-centered, not category-centered. And th this was a little thought that crossed my mind, that if when you meet a person who you're going to help or support or cure, you begin to think of them as a category rather than as an individual, then you're moving away from person-centered, aren't you? And you're bound to do it. You say, this person falls into the category of diabetes 1 or whatever, and there are certain things I know about how people who fall into that category should be treated. But it's a constant danger, isn't it? Shifting so much into dealing with categories and not enough dealing with individuals. Um, then my last little plea, uh, I don't think person-centered or personalization means anything unless you can demonstrate some difference in the process of delivery. Something must be done differently as a consequence of subscribing to personalization. And furthermore, something should be happening in the service user outcomes, which wasn't happening before. Now, the personalization program uh, of choice support, these are some of its features. First of all, every person has a person-centered plan bit more bureaucracy, you might think, but very valuable bureaucracy. Because instead of talking about this as being a group of people with learning disabilities, each individual person has a person-centered plan for support. Now, remember, this is social support rather than health care. You might think there's nothing unusual about a person-centered plan in health care, but it's much more unusual when you're talking about social support, where there is a disposition to give everybody one suits everybody solution. The person-centered plan moves away from that. Expressing the person-centered plan financially is this notion of the individual service fund. This means profound changes in the nature of support. And as I'll be saying in the moment, one of the challenges facing choice support was not just writing a paper on personalization. It was making sure that the team of staff actually believed in it, understood it, and were able to carry it out. And that was a profound shift. Part of that was they appointed some more staff called personal assistants who came in on the assumption that their job was to assist an individual to fulfill their person-centered plan. The first thing we were asked to look at is something that's now being described in the report as better nights. And this was a shift in the night support pattern. Now, the night support pattern used to be known as waking nights. And the idea was that in these houses I was talking about, one member of support staff would, notionally, stay awake all night and therefore would be on call if there were any problems with any of the service users. And it made a lot of sense. It had a high face validity because you were saying these, this is a vulnerable group. Things could go wrong during the night. You need somebody there to look after them. Well, what Southwark did was to shift from waking nights, as it was called, to sleep in, which means the member of support staff actually slept in the house following the same notional schedule as the service users. So that was bringing in an element of normality. But of course, you then had to look at the risks and you had to manage the risks. So I'll be telling you about more about that at a moment. Um, we, our method, because program evaluation has to be evidence-based. And like any gathering of evidence, it's the, uh, gathering of evidence, there are limits to what you can do. So we tend to use, as an important element, a systematic audit of what's going on against the stated objectives. And what we did with Better Nights was we audited the outcomes. Bravo. For those who know the program, no, we don't. So we actually audited the outcomes uh, in terms of quality of life, but also in terms of the extent to which risks were management, uh, managed. The amazing thing is that in doing all this and in actually producing better support, choice support actually saved substantial sums of money. They didn't start off, well maybe they did, but uh, maybe they had to. But the prime objective wasn't to save money. The prime objective was to move to a better support. And that better support, as it works out actually, is cheaper. It required a culture change. It required creativity from the support workers in terms of working in new ways. 
and it needed to be managed, and that's a very important message. It's not just a question of saying the managers are evil, of course they are inherently evil, but <laughs> if, if there's a new innovation coming in, you can't just rely on the innovative practitioner to do it. You need the innovative practitioner to do it, but it has to be managed both strategically and operationally. Now a little bit more about some of the mechanisms. Person-centered plans, which are as they sound, a plan which took account of all the needs and as far as you could the aspirations of individuals to plan what kind of support would be provided. Uh, to help that, Choice Support and others have developed PCP tools and these tools are not just you know, another bit of bureaucratic structure, they're actually an aid for people to make sure they're attending to all the important features. There's a focus in person-centered plans, obviously, on providing services to individuals. They must have a plan. They're not just an analysis of needs, and they're not just a wish list. They have to produce an operational plan so that you actually know whether you're doing it or not. And one mechanism which helped in the development of these person-centered plans was the idea of a circle of care. So the support worker, the manager, the advocate, if there were an advocate, somebody from social services, the parent or relative would be a circle of care who would either develop the person-centered plan or at least they'd validate it when they saw it. Individual service funds, which I've referred to a few times, this is an individual budget for support as opposed to a block grant. So you have to know where it's come from. The block grant idea is simple enough. You say we've got 70 people here with profound learning difficulties. Typically, per capita, they should receive so much. So this is the block grant. And you then have to start splitting up the block grant. And the temptation, of course, is to provide a similar service for everybody because it's much neater and it relates to the per capita. So the shift from the block grant to an individual budget, uh, Choice Support's role in that would be to manage the ISF as an agent on behalf of the service user. Now obviously when you're talking about people with profound learning difficulties you couldn't say here you are, here's your money, you spend it the way you wish. I mean, that, frankly that would be a nonsense. So you have to have a benign agent who is trying to find the best ways of spending the individual service fund to actually meet the needs and aspirations of the service user. The relationship between the purchaser, in this case Southwark, and uh, the provider Quite a fraught one, actually, because it was Choice Support's job to say, look, we've looked at these individuals, we've produced a person-centered plan for each, this is the support we think they'll need, it'll cost so much, and of course the purchaser is always trying to save money and give the least money, and they would be looking at the kind of sums that would arise and say, that's too much, can we not trim that down? So it was quite a fraught relationship, but a necessary and the fact that you had to finish up with an individual service fund meant that it was unavoidable. You couldn't just say, this is difficult, we'll all go home or we'll go away and complain and so on. You had to finish up with an individual service fund. It's then the responsibility of choice support to manage that budget. It's a protected budget and the provider can be as flexible as possible in achieving desired outcomes. Which brings me on to another case study the shift from the nomothetic to the ideographic for the benefit of the philosophers here in case they were falling asleep. Uh, this is John. John is on the left and his support staff is holding his hand and you can see John's, I think, smiling actually. But I think John, that's a lovely picture, but it gives you an idea that when somebody has profound learning difficulties, not only can they not speak, but they may well not have the same repertoire of interactional skills which we rely on normally. So a support worker has to be very sensitive to affective cues and really understanding what's making a person happy and so on. Well, John, at the beginning of this process, would sit on the ground and refuse to move. But since his individual service fund, he's learned a number of new skills. He is now walking independently and you might say, so what? Well, if you spend most of your time sitting on the ground, walking is quite an achievement, isn't it? He will ask to go out for a drive. He's lost a lot of weight. His brothers and sisters are now involved in a way that they weren't before. 
because often families with somebody with profound learning disability, I'm not saying they don't love them in one sense, but it can be very convenient to just get them tucked away and forget about them and rationalize it and say, oh, well, somebody's looking after them. So actually getting a proper engagement from a family is quite an achievement. So that's John. Now, getting back to better nights. I don't know how I'm doing on time. But yeah. Okay, oh, that's good. Okay, well, that's about right. Yeah, okay. Now, getting back to better nights, I explained to you this was a change from waking nights, when the, the member of Care Staff was awake all night, to sleep in, where the member of Care Staff slept in. What about it? Well, assistive technology was very important, uh, because one thing that's worrying, of course, is the idea that um, the learning disabled person might wet their bed. Now, there are pads which will detect any change in liquids around in the sheets and so on, they'll ring an alarm and the sleeping member of staff can go in and do something about it. So there are various forms of assistive technology, movement sensors and so on, which can substitute for the person being awake all night watching, which is a very abnormal situation, isn't it? Which brings me on to the next thing, that one of the virtues of this shift was a measure of normalization. So the people with learning disabilities are living in a house where Roughly speaking, everybody would go to bed at the same time, allowing for individual variations, of course. And roughly speaking, everybody would wake up in the morning, and it would be like being in a normal house. Now, we found in our evaluation that there was a lot of evidence of normalization and the beneficial effects. Increased independence. Some service users would now get up and make themselves a cup of tea. You might say, Again, so what? But you always have to see this in context. That is an amazing achievement for somebody who before, if they wanted a cup of tea, would have gone to the member of staff who was uh, there for waking nights and they would have made the tea for them. So increased independence. Risk management was very important because, as is often the case with care of a vulnerable group, people who are set in one way of providing the care, they're not doing it through any malign intent. They're doing it because they think they're providing the best. And they're very worried when you ask them to change. So if you say, look, we don't want you to be awake all night. We want you to sleep in. They are extremely worried about it. They're worried about the risks. So an important part of our uh, evaluation was evaluating the way these risks have been managed. And of course, the lovely bottom line, this change from paying people to be awake all night to paying people but letting them sleep in achieved very substantial savings. A little bit about uh, evaluation, because that was another thing I thought. I, I really don't know how familiar you are with program evaluation as a discipline, but it is a well-established discipline, and in many areas of activity, it's a requirement of funding. You know, the government says, yeah, indeed. And there's, there's good and bad program evaluation, of course. You remember the three, three jokes, or the three lies. Of course, I'll still love you in the morning. The check is in the post, darling. And I'm from the evaluators, and I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, uh, we were given a contract to evaluate the change from waking nights to sleep in. And then, in discussion with Choice Support, we said, well, look, um, this change of nights is just part of your personalization program. Could we perhaps look at the program more broadly and evaluate the whole impact of personalization? And they agreed we should. Now, what does a good external evaluation do? Well, first of all, it's an external verification that outcomes have been met. Now, in terms of deciding what those outcomes are, that's obviously a discussion between the evaluator and the provider. And the provider needs to know what kind of outcomes they're trying to achieve. Otherwise, what are they playing at? So one part of the evaluation is either to measure the outcomes directly or at least to verify what kind of measurements there are. The second thing is, uh, important part of evaluation, is we describing... Finish. Sorry? We need to finish because... We need to finish. Office. Okay. Well, maybe if I went to Australia, I could finish from there, could I? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should, should we say five minutes maximum? Yes, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll move on at great speed. I'm, I'm not going to neglect this, though, and that is the shoe trident. In any evaluation, we try and do three things. We try to look at the outcomes, see if they've been met, we try to describe the process so that somebody else could copy what's gone on. And finally, we try and take all the stakeholder perspectives. Now, moving on at great speed, 
uh, and I'll tell you where you can buy the reports or get the reports free at the end so you don't need my detail. Um, we used outcome audits both for better nights and for personalization and one of the things that structured our audit tool was we used a thing called keys to citizenship produced by a man called Simon Duffy who said the way to look at learning disabled people is to say what should any citizen expect and they actually produced a set of objectives to do with self-determination, direction, money, a home, the right support and a community life which he says is the right of any citizen and also the right of somebody with learning disabilities. Now I'm going to jump on at dizzying speed even passing over Peter who's smiling in the front of the car there. Peter used some of his in individual service fund to buy a car doesn't drive it, of course, but he actually goes out in his own car. Stakeholder perspectives. So, the conclusion, this is the last bit, Chair. Uh, improved quality of life for the majority of the 70 service users, as measured by our audits. Substantial net savings. Largely favourable views from support staff and relatives. Not uniformly favourable, because some of them are still worried, but favourable. A minority of 12 had not enjoyed an improvement in quality of life. Now, they hadn't had a deterioration, but they hadn't improved. So Choice Support are looking extremely closely at those particular individuals now to see whether there's something in the whole approach which simply hasn't captured their needs. Individual service funds and person-centered plans, definitely a success. The management approach, which was principled, determined, and focused, was essential for strategic planning to match operational planning. We recommended two things. First, that personalization should be rolled out to other commissions. And lastly, the case studies should be produced of the minority to try and find out why this wonderful approach didn't work with absolutely everybody. We hope we'll learn from that. Now, if you're interested in what I've been saying, I hope you are, then I'd refer you to the Center for Policy, Re uh, Policy Reform who have published three reports. Better Nights was the last one. They published one on ISFs and they published ones on the need analysis tools and that is the web address. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>